Hi there folks, Paul here, signing in for another video. Hello, welcome, thank you for taking the time to come and join with me. In this video, we are going to continue on our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, getting back on track over Christmas, uh, over the new year, of course, short break period, a few other videos slotted in there, got a little bit behind time, but we'll get back on track today, continuing on Matthew 5, we're going to look at uh, verses 17 through 20. Now, this is an interesting section of Scripture. In mine, uh, there's a little heading. It's at the top. It says, Christ fulfills the law. And many of us will just will quite happily skip over this or at least just glaze through it to have a, a cursive look and just go, yep, okay, I don't need to worry about that. But the thing is, there is so much in this section of Scripture and the Holy Scriptures, new and, as we would call it, Old Testament as well, it is good to understand. There is great value and, and wisdom for us in understanding. And I hope to be able to illustrate that to you as to why it is so important that we cannot just do away with it and because, hey, Christ fulfilled the law, therefore we don't need to worry about it. So I don't have time to go into a full study, but let me give you at least enough to be able to perhaps food for thought, maybe something to chew over, something to pray about and go, okay, Lord, is there something more here for me? What should I be doing now in this time in my life? So let me just quickly read through it, and then we'll come back and we'll have a look. Verse 17, Matthew 5. Do not think, Jesus says, that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. So I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. Verse 19. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, verse 20, that unless your righteousness exceed, exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. couple of things there. If you've got a pen, perhaps you want to underline, you don't mind doing that. Verse 19, great in the kingdom of heaven at the very end there. Verse 20, righteousness will by no means enter. And in verse 18, all, till all is fulfilled. Hold those thoughts. We'll come through, come back to them in just one moment. But let's have a look at verse 17. Christ fulfills the law. Okay, good. But do not think, he says, that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, quick history lesson. The law, generally speaking, refers to, well, the law is the first five books. And then everything else in the Old Testament, generally speaking, the prophets. I know we've got the Psalms, we've got the Proverbs and so on, but generally speaking, the first five books and then the prophets, everything else. And as we look at those, we must remember, um, you may remember in Galatians 3, I believe it is, uh, Paul wrote saying that the, the law is a, a tutor, a, a schoolmaster for us, so to speak, to bring us towards Christ, to bring us to the knowledge of, of righteousness and Christ and everything. It's the explanation. And I want you to remember this point. This is so important as we read through New Testament Scripture. Thinking about Old Testament Scripture, they didn't have it. They didn't have this New Testament scripture that we now have. First century Christian, Christians, the apostles, they didn't have it. They only had the law and the prophets. We now have this incredible explanation, which is what it is. The New Testament explaining the law and the prophets for us, how it brings us to Christ. Because if it was up to me with my cultural history and background, I probably we wouldn't get it. But it is for us a schoolmaster, a, a tutor, to teach us how to come to Christ. He says, I didn't come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. And Romans 10.4 says, for Christ is the end of the law, listen, for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now that makes me think the law for righteousness. Perhaps there's maybe also more to the law. 
hold that thought. We will come back to that. I want to continue on just for the moment, if I can. A couple of other scriptures that are worthwhile illustrating this point. Matthew 13, 35, Jesus spoke. He said that it might be fulfilled. Here's an example of him fulfilling what was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundations of the world. And he spoke in that particular time so many parables and said, I speak in parables. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Some didn't. Some would understand, some wouldn't. Romans 3.21 says, but now the righteousness of God, there's that word again. The righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Taking this righteousness thing out of apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In summary, let me say this, and we're going to come back to it with a better illustration, I believe, to help perhaps cement this idea. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come but to fulfill. In its simplest, Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets in the sense that they all point to him he is the fulfillment of because they point to him that is probably the easiest best explanation i can give but we see from these other scriptures the end of the law for righteousness so i will come back to that in just one moment hold that thought why is righteousness being set apart separately here Verse 18, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot, one tittle will by no means pass away from the law. Now, this refers to, I guess, crossing uh, your T's, dotting the I's, one jot or one tittle. It means every single part of it will not pass away till all, underline that word, till all is fulfilled. The question to ask, has it all been fulfilled yet? Now, I have a note here for myself, 2 Timothy 3, 15, 16. Let me just quickly come to that and we'll read. Perhaps you can follow along. Paul writing to Timothy here. And as I mentioned, they didn't have New Testament scripture. We do. They didn't. Paul says, verse 15 of 3, 2 Timothy, from childhood you have known the holy scriptures. He's talking about the law and the prophets which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And that's where our salvation comes from, through faith in Christ. All scripture, he says, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in what? Righteousness. There's that word again. All scripture... The Old Testament he's talking about, we know from other scriptures, all scripture, old and new for us, but for them, old only. Profitable for instruction, for correction, for reproof, for training. Instruction in righteousness. Has it all been fulfilled is the question I'm asking you today. Verse 19, who uh, therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments, the least, and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. What does he mean by the least of one of these commandments when it comes to the law? Let me just come over to Matthew 23. Interesting. This one came up in church today also, our, uh, our pastor speaking on righteousness talked about in Matthew 23 3 so here we are let's dig back in woe to you scribes and Pharisees Jesus says hypocrites you pay tithe of your mint and you know anise and which is like dill and, and cumin and you have neglected the weightier matters of the law justice mercy faith Jesus knew that when it came to the different parts of the law and this is what I want you to understand there are different parts some are more important than others. This is what I want you to be able to sort of grasp hold of. 
And in this particular example here, we have the scribes and the Pharisees trying to seek out righteousness for themselves. Yes, and so we will pay our tithe, we'll pay our tenth. So, you know, here's my, my basket of, uh, of mint. And I'm going to write part one and it's divided up. One part for me, two parts for me, three, four, five, six parts for me, seven, eight, nine parts for me. Oh, ten. I have to give that one to God. One part for me, two parts for me, three, four, eight, nine, oh, ten. I have to give that part to God. And they were seeking righteousness in their actions of what they do. And he says, woe to them, hypocrites. You have forgotten about the important things. Not to say that we shouldn't tithe, but the important thing is what's in here. This is the key. And whoever does these things, Jesus said, will be great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you're by no means going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is where they would have gone, wait, what? What? I can't do that. The scribes, the Pharisees, they're the ones who explained the law. They're the ones who explained what righteousness was. People hearing this at the time would have gone, how is that possible? We know now through faith in Christ, our righteousness, clothed with righteousness. We know that now. But these things were just starting to be revealed then. Romans 6.17 says, But God, God be thanked that, thro that, though, that though you, you too, were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Listen. You obeyed from the heart. We have this, this phrase in modern Christian, I'm not a fan of it, give your heart to God. Yes, we must give it to him. But it's obeying, obeying from the heart, not just, oh God, I want to follow you. So much more. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, one of my favorite verses of all time, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, Sorry, if anyone he is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things, all things, there it is again, all things have become new. Back to verse 17, because that's the foundation scripture for this section, and we'll wrap it up. Do not think, Jesus says, that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, two reasons why he said this. Number one, so that those Pharisees who might be listening or have the word passed on to them would just go, hmm, okay. Coming out of the gate, he didn't want to destroy that relationship straight away because it wasn't yet his time for to be revealed nor to go to the cross. Do not think that I came to destroy it. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. So my question to you here is, if we read in Scripture, and I read, for example, that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness in Romans 10, are there other parts to the law? Because nothing will pass away from the law until, verse 18, all is fulfilled. Has all been fulfilled yet? That's the question. In a nutshell, looking at the law, there are five different parts to it. And we'll just quickly skip through these and then explanation as to why. There are moral laws. So the moral laws, you'd be familiar with them, things like the Ten Commandments and others that, that talk about ethical or moral law. Um, they are considered universal. They are considered timeless. They, they are what they are. They, they don't change. Things that deal with things like murder or theft, lying, moral law. Then there are also ceremonial laws. Now, these pertain to uh, worship and sacrifice, you know, festivals, the different days of the calendar and so on. Uh, temple practices, these laws were all applied to that. They were specific to the religious life of Israel and point towards, they all point towards, as I said earlier, that sacrificial work of Christ, the Lamb of God. A lamb was sacrificed in the temple, but Jesus Christ became the Lamb for us for our sacrifice. 
Then there were also civil and sort of judicial laws. These you might relate to what we have in our courts today, for example. And they were for governing of Israel as a nation, regulations about property and social justice and all of these different things, community relations. They were particular to Israel, certainly within that time, surrounded by other nations. And we have to think about the why. And I might just throw this in now. Why so many laws? 613, I think it is. Why? Let's look at their history very quickly and the period to which these laws were given to them. So they're you know, in the wilderness in that time with Moses through the book of Exodus. They've just come, Exodus, out of Egypt. Generations in Egypt in slavery under a nation not godly by any means. And the practices and the, the, the ways of living in Egypt so far removed from what God would have for them. And so therefore, when they came out of Egypt, God literally had to give them instruction. The law was for them an instruction book on how to live. Two parts to it primarily. One was how to live separate from the world for God. And two was how to live separate from the world around them. How to be separate from other nations. And things like the dietary laws. The dietary laws were a great part of that, showing themselves as separate, uh, kosher. You might have heard the phrase, kosher laws, what you can, what you can't eat, to be separate from the other nations. And then there were the laws of purity and cleanliness, and these were rituals about cleanliness, you know, dealing with uh, disease and illness and things like that. So they're the five different parts to the law. They point to Jesus fulfilling the law has all yet been fulfilled that is the question i keep coming back to i want to read a quite a, a very famous well-known section of scripture you might know this as a point of illustration that no not all is yet fulfilled now i'm reading from isaiah 61 jesus quoted this section of scripture he read it um, in the synagogue one time math uh, luke 14 i think it was so luke 4 sorry he reads, and I'll just read here, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is prophecy about Him. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty for the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he finished there. That prophecy is about him and he said that in the synagogue he said this day this prophecy is fulfilled remember back here matthew 5 i did not come to destroy but to fulfill but then he says in verse 18 none of this law is going to though going to pass away until all is fulfilled let me read the next, ver the next line, not even the next verse, just the next line, which he didn't quote. And the day of vengeance of our God. Verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He finished there, but left off. And the day of vengeance of our God, because he then said today, this day, this is fulfilled in your sight. But he did not say about the day of vengeance. What is the day of vengeance? It is what's also known as that great and terrible day of the Lord. It is the second coming of Christ. Judgment. That is the day of vengeance. So no, not all of the law has yet been fulfilled. The law and the prophets. It's not all yet fulfilled. Jesus came. Jesus took part. We read there in Romans 10, the end of the law of righteousness. Because in Christ... We see the fulfillment of the ceremonial laws. We see them fulfilled. But if they're done away with, if we are to think that they are now irrelevant, shall we then just break the moral laws? Murder? Lying? Theft? Adultery? No. Absolutely not. Jesus fulfilled a part of those laws, a part of those prophecies, with yet still some to be fulfilled. Now, I don't remember the number, but it's in the hundreds, hundreds upon hundreds, I believe, of prophecies that were fulfilled through him. And yet there are, folks, there are still some to come. 
And as Paul illustrated to Timothy and also wrote elsewhere, that entire section of Scripture, the Old Testament as we now call it, it's all they had. It explains Christ. So if you want to understand Christ, and I hope you do more, study also with the relevant explanation in New Testament, the Old. Can you see where I'm going? I want to finish off with this, an illustration. I don't know who's listening at the moment, and I don't know whether or not you've ever listened to sort of classical music. Now, I grew up not as a musician, but I have musicians in my family, and for some reason, whenever, the, <laughs> whenever you're learning to play an instrument nine times out of ten, particularly if it's an instrument that might be part of an orchestra, you're going to learn classical music, and they did. And so I got to hear a lot of it. I did develop some kind of odd, strange love for classical music. I don't listen to it often. Um, but I find it quite relaxing in those times when I want to. Candy, my wife, she gets kind of a bit worried. She'll hear me listening to classical music and go, Oh, well, baby, what's, what's wrong? You stressed? What's the problem? But the thing about a good, beautiful symphony, it has many parts to it. And if you have the right conductor and you have the right players, it's beautiful. It truly is. I want you to think about the law and the prophets, so the Old Testament as a symphony. It has different parts to it. Each on their own, they don't quite make sense, do they? They don't quite make sense. But then comes Jesus to fulfill, to explain, to embody and think of it like this. He is the master conductor. Not only can he direct the players, but the players are also a part of him, us, through the Holy Spirit. The players are a part of him. This symphony, it itself is a part of him. He is it as well. The master conductor. And so when he said that he came to fulfill like he, the master conductor, is, is stepping out on the stage. He doesn't discard the symphony. He plays it. He guides it. He directs it. He reveals its deeper meanings and the beautiful harmonies that are in there. He shows through it love and mercy and the heart attitude of the players. And he fulfills it in that sense. And as it builds to a crescendo and comes to that finale, which is him. We see what was once maybe just a shadow, now fully alive and vibrant and magnificent and beautiful. Jesus fulfills the law in the sense that he completes it. It cannot be played without his part. It cannot be played. He brings it to its intended beauty and glory. And that is Christ. Without him, none of it really means anything. Without it, the conductor has no purpose. They are one and together. So folks, as we go through this, my challenge to you is this. Did Jesus come to fulfill it? Yes. Was all fulfilled? Has all been fulfilled yet? No. What is our part now in this? Our part as the musician is to allow the master conductor to guide us, to move us, and let his heart become ours. As he does it, we do it. That is our part until all is fulfilled. And if you want to know more of understanding Christ, understand the law and the prophets. There's a reason there for everything. And so take more than this part of the book and add this part as well. All right, folks, thank you so much for joining with me in this section. I hope you found this valuable. I'll be praying for you. I do. I do. We'll talk again soon. Bye-bye.